Okay, I would like to welcome everyone back to the second half of the this network to archaeology session with these papers related to the ongoing crane project. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to stretch and perhaps get some coffee or espresso or whatever um, one drinks for a break. Our next paper is going to be delivered by Graham Phillip from Durham University. And I will leave Graham to introduce the rest of his uh, co-presenters, if he so chooses. Uh, Graham's presentation is entitled Isotopic Research as a Tool for Reconstructing Human-Environment Interaction in the Near East. Take it away, Graham. OK, I hope everybody can hear me. Right, um, this project was funded through the AHRC's Newton Halliday program. And it's a partnership between Durham University, Yarmouk University, with the collaboration of the Department of Antiquities. So the, the underlying aim was to understand the degree of heterogeneity of the population in the Jordan Valley over the long term. One way of doing this, we thought, was to look at a, a multi-isotopic analysis of human remains from the extensive cemeteries at the site of Pella, where they, they span from the EB4 through to the Byzantine period. Um, this is going to be supplemented by material from Yarmouk University excavations of Roman period tombs at the sites of Abila and Saad up in the North Jordanian Plateau. But before we can really interpret human or animal isotopic data, we need to gain a basic understanding of the distribution of the key isotopes in the natural environment. And that's what we're talking about today. Now, over the last decade, the mapping of stable isotopes in natural, natural environment has become a very useful tool for archaeologists, particularly for studying mobility and migration. And this slide shows a selection of the maps that have, uh, that have been produced. There's a, um, an oxygen, Delta Oxygen 18 map for Italian Peninsula, maps for Denmark, strontium isotope maps for Britain. And you can see how between 2010 on the right and 2018 on the left, these have improved. And here are maps for the Caribbean. But you'll see looking at the Caribbean that the upper, the orange basically image, she tells you that the oxygen isotopes are allow relatively little differentiation across many parts of northern South America. However, when you can introduce strontium isotopes as well, you can start to get more variation. And the way forward is probably multi the use of multiple isotopes. And finally, we have here a map of uh, the adjacent area of northern Israel and the occupied Jolan. So for our work, we collected samples from 113 areas of Jordan. The, the, there have been some isotopic studies of mobility of animals and humans in Jordan, but the samples have generally been small and they're often quite site or location specific. And on the whole, people have used uh, carbon and oxygen isotopes or sometimes nitrogen if they're studying diet. Strontium has been implied uh, applied less often. But one of the big difficulties is the limited information available on uh, local baseline variability, the variability in the bioavailable isotope values. And this has been recognized by many studies. So the key aim of this project, or one of the two main aims, was to create a multi-isotopic base map for Jordan, sometimes referred to as an isoscape map. And we had a program of field data collection through 2019-20, one summer season and one winter season. And the map shows where we sampled locations. We focused in those areas where we, we would expect a significant part of the human or animal population to be spending large amounts of time. So we sampled 113 locations, um, took 118 samples for strontium, mostly plants and some snail shell, 142 plant samples for uh, delta carbon 13, and 62 water samples for oxygen isotopes. So to start with strontium isotopes, strontium has four stable naturally occurring isotopes, but only strontium 87 
is radiogenic. It forms from the beta decay of 87 rubidium. And the ratio of 87 strontium to 86 strontium can be used to trace biosphere processes. And this diagram shows how um, strontium isotope ratios cycle through the environment from the soils into plants, into animals, and ultimately into humans. And the natural variation of strontium is generally controlled by the underlying geology. Uh, homogeneous rock types like limestone tend to release um, fairly consistent strontium isotope data, as they consist mainly of calcium and carbonate. Heterogeneous rock types like granites, however, can uh, release a variety of strontium isotope ratios, depending on exactly which minerals are weathering out of them. Other things you need to think about when interpreting strontium data are the problems that arise from things like quaternary deposits, uh, glacial till, alluvium deposits, wadi fans, which can uh, contain an amalgamation of several different geologies, depending what is washing down in the wadi. And one final note is that unlike stable isotopes, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, commonly used in archaeology, um, fractionation that occurs because of low temperature, uh, geological, biological or biochemical processes is negligible in strontium isotopes. Okay, there we are. So this map shows our samples and the colouring from dark blue are uh, low isotope ratios going through greens and brown with the higher isotope ratios. And these symbols, the symbols, we'll come on to the symbols in a minute, show exactly what we were collecting. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of similarity, although there are some quite striking differences as well. But a lot of the isotopic values are in this range here. We have utilized some previously published strontium isotope data where it's available, and that will appear in uh, the next few slides. For this presentation, we've really focused on strontium isotope data from a few of the major geological units. And it's the cyan, the bright blue that we're referring to. So this is the Cretaceous limestone data, and it gives a range. Some of these are our own samples. Some of these are other people's samples. And as you can see, the highest values come from one particular site up here, a place called Barashta Forest in northern Jordan. This was sampled during our fieldwork. It mostly consists of Kermes oak trees, but both the oak and the underlying shrubbery sampled came back consistently with 7085, which is r remarkably high, sorry, um, high values. The Cretaceous chalks, marls and limestones here, again, indicate a range of values, generally fairly tight, as you can see along here. These higher values, 709s and so on, have not been included in the average, but these are a combination of our own data and data from a previous paper by Schuen, and these include archaeological gazelle and a modern plant sample from Wadi Hama 27 and some plant samples from the Pella area. We suspect these high values come from the presence of um, what's called knob limestone, which is an evaporite deposit um, from ancient springs, from the point when the uh, Dead Sea would have come much higher up the valley. So we think the evaporation deposits here are affecting, are, have some kind of impact here on the values. And finally, the neogene basalts of Eastern Jordan. And again, they have slightly different values from the chalks and limestones. These, this is the area known as the Hara. They have lower average and median strontium isotope values. This tells us that migration from the basalts should be identifiable in animals and in human enamel. Interestingly, however, if we go back and look at the average value here, which is 7079, 
This is a fairly recently published map by an Israeli research team. As you can see, 704, 705, 706, it does suggest that it should be possible to differentiate the Jordanian Badia basalts from the basalts of the Jolan and the Galilee area, which is potentially quite interesting. Okay. Here we have um, the various outcrops. These are the basalts here with the uh, mean and stand two standard deviations, a set of the various limestones, uh, different types of limestones and so on. And then one or two other sources over here, Catanary deposits down at the Dead Sea. Um, so you can see that the basalts are lower, but there is some overlap with the limestones. Interestingly, we this if any of you have looked at um, Chris Stantis's article on the strontium isotopes in the uh, Teladaba population, she identifies one group as being non-local, i.e. not born in the Nile Valley. And their values fall here, which is almost spot on for the limestones. Now, this is not to say that we think that the Teladaba people necessarily come from Jordan. I suspect that a lot of the limestones in the southern Levant are going to produce broadly similar values. But it does tend to confirm that the the migrant part of that population in the Eastern Delta in the Middle Bronze Age has a Levantine connection, which is what the material culture would make you suspect. Then over here, we have a Quaternary deposit done by the Dead Sea, which again have very, very different values and are relatively easy to identify. Moving on to the uh, Delta Carbon 13, Okay. Carbon isotopes, the, uh, the ratio of carbon, the carbon isotopes depends on the type of plants. C4 plants, predominantly in Jordan, arid zone plants uh, give different values. They have a slightly different uh, photosynthetic pathway from C3 plants, which tend to be the Mediterranean zone species. Okay. So there's a, when we plot up the values, we can see there's a general trend towards lower values in the north of the country for our C3 plants. The C4 plants are mainly where we'd expect them in the Indo-Turanian and the Saharo Arabian zone out here. There are, of course, C4 plants as well out in this area. They're not all uh, C, uh, sorry, C3 plants out in this area as well. They're not all C4 plants. So what we can do is plot up the values of um, carbon isotope values versus precipitation. And there's a general trend towards the darker greens in the north, where there's higher precipitation, and the lighter greens to the south, where precipitation is lower. That's for C4 plants. And then, sorry, C3 plants and the C4 plants are mostly out in the east. You can also see, again, the same sort of trends with elevation as well. Uh, you get the, the darker colours tend to be in the higher elevation zones where rainfall is higher. Now, the other thing we've been working on is the oxygen isotope data. And there's a standard way of reporting this. Um, it's, it, we're talking about the ratio of uh, oxygen oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 and fractionation occurs during rain out and evaporation processes. But there are a number of environmental factors that affect how this uh, fractionation plays through. These include things like the distance from the sea, seasonality, values changed by season, altitude, temperature, the quantity of rainfall and so on. So oxygen is probably the most complex. You get quite marked seasonal differences. And to think of a typical North Jordanian wadi system, a community down in the Jordan Valley, like the population of Pella, might be drawing water from uh, the local wadi system. But it may well be that in winter, that wadi system is predominantly carrying um, seasonal runoff water. In summer, it may be... Uh, groundwater, springs, spring fed, and 
the groundwater may well have a different oxygen isotope values from the, the rainfall. So this is a, just indicative of the kind of complexities we have to deal with. Evaporation is also another significant issue. And quite a number of the water sources out east um, are things like pools and reservoirs where evaporation is a problem. You think of a site like Jawa, which depended on water capture. And clearly the oxygen ratios by the early summer are probably quite different from the ratios at the time of the rainfall. And this is what you're seeing with these red, reds and yellows out here, whereas you get dark blue values in the north and bright blue values along the hilltops. However, at the moment, we've only got the summer data set. The winter data set for oxygen has not been run yet because the lab closed down uh, over COVID and it's only now catching up with its backlog. Okay, just to go through the last few quickly, this is our data for surface water. This is precipitation data from the Jordanian Water Authority. And this is a set of groundwater data. And you can see the differences already that the groundwater data is surprisingly different from the surface water data. So this just gives an indication of the kind of complexities we're going to have to deal with. So I should just finish off by thanking uh, Musa, Ali, Musa Ali Musa Sarvel from Yarmouk University, who was the driver for the field season, Maria Abdullan, an ME student from Yarmouk University who helped the team, Carol Palmer and Firas Bakin at CBRL, and our Jordanian partners from Yarmouk University, uh, Khaled al-Bashaira and Abdullah al-Sharman, who provided all kinds of help to make this work. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris. Yes, uh, I, I just have to say to the uh, to the rest of the room here. I mean, there's so many things going on behind the scenes here that um, anyway. Um, so I really just want to emphasize uh, thanks to everyone for their patience. Um, yes, and uh, uh, thank you, Graham, for wrapping up. We do have a we do yeah. have a few minutes here if you uh, for some questions. Yes, and I must I apologize. Think I, I didn't realize that the connection had gone because I can't see that window at the moment when I've got the everything else open. Yeah, I was kicked out as well. So I think a bunch of us might have been kicked out. Who knows what happened? But in any case, um, so if anyone out there does have a quick question, we do have a few minutes here before we move to the next one, to the next presentation. Um, I do want to ask you sort of a, a general question. It's it's the inevitable crane question that I've been asking many of the other presenters um, is uh, this very specific data set that you were presenting mm -hmm. uh, from Jordan. How might you see that fitting into a larger collaborative kind of Pro, you know, and, and, and yeah. endeavor uh, with others, because of course, you know, there are others now who are also um, yes. uh, doing this kind of analysis on data sets from other parts mm -hmm. of the Eastern Mediterranean. And I'd be yeah. very curious to hear what you think about that yes. kind well, of we, collaborative we, effort, possibilities. Well, I, I, anyway. uh, yeah, no, we'd be very keen to share this data. The aim is to get it published fairly quickly, the, the baseline data sets to, to get it published fairly quickly and make it available. Then we'll work at just perhaps a slightly slower pace on the actual archaeological uh, application, which is the, the Pella and SAD um, and Abila data, uh, human data sets. I think the sooner this is made available, the better. But as I was saying, some of it is quite complicated to interpret. The strontium is fairly straightforward. The oxygen is complicated. And I think sometimes people haven't really understood how things like evaporation and seasonality play in. And we'd have to think quite carefully about how that would affect livestock or humans, you know, how it averages out over a season or a year. But we're very keen to share it. We're also keen to do more such work in other areas if it's possible. I'm also going to just take the liberty to um, note um, Dan earlier in the chat, Dan Lawrence uh, flagged on uh, uh, radiocarbon, just a really important um, mm -hmm. release of or publication of 
a data set um, of what is it? I'm just checking here, close to 11,000 uh, radiocarbon dates from about 1,000 sites uh, be, uh, with the time range between yeah. 14 and 2,000 uh, year uh, range. And it's part of an ongoing data set that they will be uploading or updating step by step as new data comes available. And the link is in the chat just to flag that and let people know about that. Um, it's part of this larger ongoing um, really um, the, the, the growth of data sets uh, on all these different types of data is, is really quite um, breathtaking, honestly, um, and, and very exciting. So I, I'm just checking to see here how our, whether our next presenter is ready. Um, and I'm also just checking to see whether there are any other questions in the chat. I think we are at the ready are we ready to go for the next presentation i'm just asking our, our it person here it sounds like they're still i'm um, having a little bit of uh, connection issues as well so if you well, have any other thoughts if you have any other a question or two if, if you know if if anyone has any if i yes. can answer them is I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole team here Unfortunately, Lucy, the postdoc who did most of this work, has now just a few weeks ago left archaeology and has a, a job as a manager in the National Health Service, at least a trainee manager. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's what comes of having a conservative government. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, do you all actually another part of this, another question I had is also trying to connect with some of the coring in the paleo environmental sequences. Mm. And I know that you've also been involved um, with uh, overseeing and coordinating some of that effort. And I don't know if, I, I mean, there was a note from Dan earlier um, today um, that some of the cores coming back from Southern Iraq have just arrived in Durham. And so just a more general question again of yeah. um, the kind of analyses that might be done on those cores and how that might relate to some of the isotope analysis that you just were presenting here. I'm just uh, yeah. looking for connections here to be uh, honest. Yeah, I think it, it the analysis, it, it all depends. The first thing is to see what the cores actually look like, what the sediments are. But obviously, it, you know, it would be good to get decent dated sequences from three different areas of southern Iraq to understand if they are all completely different or if they're broadly homogenous. But there may be some pollen pr preservation. You can certainly look at um, uh, we would call it the, the composition of the deposits in the cores for periods of aggradation, periods of slow sedimentation, possible breaks and interruptions and so on. Um, mollusks, that kind of thing. And obviously, perhaps we might try luminescence OSL for dating. If there are, if there is samples suitable for radiocarbon dating, that's fine. But in areas where you have a lot of alluvium, you're never quite sure where bits of charcoal have originally come from and how long they've been kicking around before they end up in sediments when stuff is constantly eroding and being redeposited. Whereas OSL might actually be better for the horizons between major changes. What I did, as we seem to have a minute, if I just put on this very last slide, Yes, we do have time because we're having some that, technical issues yeah. with the next okay. presentation. So that just shows where the three, the three cores are. Um, there's Baghdad, so they're deep into southern Iraq. One, they're off-site cores because we're interested in the not the urban but the the, the local natural environments or agriculturally influenced environments. But one close to Adab, one close to Larsa, and one close to Ur down by Nasiriyah. So that's where the three cores are. That's incredibly exciting, actually. <laughs> to hear yeah. that. Well, it's typical that they literally arrive today, but you know, we won't know for another couple of weeks what exactly what they look like and what kind of deposits we've got. They're they're each about fifteen meters deep, so they do go, potentially go back quite a long way. Mm, excellent. Okay, I'm just checking here with our technician and to see whether we're might be ready. I'm not sure here um, with their next presentation. Okay, we have Kathleen. Thank you, Graham. You can. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Graham. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>